Okay, welcome everyone to this series on quantum topology. Quantum topology. Um, the name is a bit misleading. There's not much quantum. There's not much topology. I guess it's motivated by quantum mechanics and by topology. But I would like to call it instead low dimensional category theory. Or why I love diagrammatics. Or let's ignore standard mass, let's draw diagrams. Will be a lot of fun, I promise you. Um, and yeah, today I'm literally just introduce it a little bit doing of the history and then we go uh, through the story and Yeah, it's based on uh, a little bit of self-promotion here. God, it's based on some lecture notes that I wrote um, They're still writing in progress. I call it quantum topology without topology I should have called it quantum topology without quantum topology, without quantum and without topology, because as I said, neither quantum nor topology. Anyway, it's based on these lecture notes, and the idea nowadays is, well, nowadays in 2025, when this is recorded, and probably still true if you really watch this, you somehow should use all methods that are available to you, right? All methods that are available to kind of try to learn. This is my, like the traditional ones, you go to a lecture or you read a book or the maybe less traditional ones, you watch a video on YouTube or whatever and that's why I'm trying to make the this quantum topology thing quite accessible. There will be a video series like literally what you're watching right now and there will be standard like, classical lecture notes like a book. Uh, a lot of us has uh, too many pages at this point. Anyway, and there will be a website and every, all that fun jazz. And whenever you find something you would like to see in the book, uh, in the lecture notes, whatever you want to call it, in a PDF, just let me know. I'm happy to kind of adjust it as we go, right? That's the whole point. And right? so it should be more interactive nowadays. You don't need to know that. But as I said, self-promotion over. So let's just jump into like... What is quantum topology? And I will always just abbreviate that by QT because uh, it's just too long and doesn't fit on a slide. Okay, so it is a Rosetta Stone. Um, so that's my, my catchphrase here. If you don't know what the Rosetta Stone is, we'll do that in a second. So the Rosetta Stone, let me just first um, pull up this picture, which is a little bit nicer if we just make it a bit bigger. So here's our Rosetta Stone. Ooh, very nice. So it has three different types of languages written on it, and the text is like always the same. Yeah, so um, the top and the middle text are Egyptian using hieroglyphs and the, the, the later updated demotic script. So this is a little bit newer. This is the, this, the classical one that we have seen before, right? The, the hieroglyphs. And then the bottom is like Old Greek. And the history here was that this stone was well, discovered and Old Greek was essentially known and it was then used to kind of translate or to understand the other types of languages. Yeah? So, because the text is essentially the same. Well, note that this is very, so usually if you have a symbolic language, it's very efficient. It's like a, a nast, nasty to set up a typeset or whatever, but it's very efficient. So this essentially this text is the same as that one, which is the old Greek one. So yeah, the Rosetta Stone, very famous. If you have not seen that one before, um, I think the British Museum ha still has it. Of course, they will not give that away. So if you're ever in London, you will see the Rosetta Stone. Do we find some nice images? Oh, beautiful. In the British Museum. British Museum, yeah? it's very nice, it's very impressive. Um, and the British Museum, as far as I know, I haven't been in the UK for a while, as far as I know, is actually free admission. So you can just go in and see this historically very important uh, type of stone, right? So translation between, here, this is a good picture, translation between those three languages. And if you just know one of them, you can kind of translate uh, and try to understand the others, right? That's the whole point. And I would like to see this as my thumbnail if you want for um, quantum topology. So quantum topology for me is a language, maybe we can go back to this thing here, that kind of translates between various fields. So I will usually stay with, a, I'm a category theorist, I know I have many videos on topology but I, I really don't care about topology honestly, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I'm, 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 I, like, I like this type of language and you kind of can use it in the same as the Rosetta Stone. 
to try to understand other types. And it's not necessarily related to what I have here, it just it just fits on the slide, you know what I mean? But anyway, something like an algebra thing, a topology thing, a physics thing, that's a, like quantum topology, quantum here, topology here maybe, a logic thing, ribbon logic or something. It's really, really nice. So it's kind of the stone translating into many fields, right? That's what makes something interesting um, if you have connections to like many different aspects of, well, modern mass, modern physics, whatever. If that's modern, who knows, really? Right? So that's my picture. Rosetta Stone, um, quantum topology is like the mixture between all of them. Okay. And essentially, the key players, which I'm going to explain, are the so-called quantum invariants. Um, they are invariants. The quantum is still a bit questionable here. But anyway, in, in the name, I mean. Um, but anyway, so essentially, they're invariants. So they're invariants of certain types of topological objects. Let's say of knots. And they work in the way, if you, an invariant usually works in the following way. You want to distinguish two knots. So are those two things here, are, are they the same? You fit in an invariant and it usually gives you a number or some numerical result. Let's say they puts out five uh, or whatever, one or something. So if your numerical invariant puts out the same number, that's why it's called an invariant, you can't, you can't do anything. You know? But if it puts out a different number, you know for sure that these things are different. Right? So invariant, kind of, you want to say, you want to detect whatever, you want to see, say, is X the same as Y? You fit it in your little black box, the invariant. The invariant says, oh, both of them have five. Then you're stuck. But if the invariant says, one of them is five, one of them is one, then you're good to go. Then you know for sure, mathematically precise, for sure, right? Proof, <laughs> you could computer verify that, um, that they're actually different. And the main key problem tradition in well, traditionally has been a while at this point, but the key problem in from roughly that time from where topology arises in the nineteenth like to Poincaré's paper, eighteen I think Poincaré's paper on topology, which started everything, was something around these this line and it had many revisions, so it was roughly uh, around this time. Yeah. And that's where it started and up to the nineteen eighties ish. Topologists studied low dimensional topology only from the viewpoint of homology theory. And yeah, low dimensional topology is this fun field in topology uh, where it's actually very different, low dimensional topology, from other types of topology. Can I spell? No, I can't. But it doesn't matter. Apparently, Google, well, of course, Google can still find out what I'm, what I'm going to talk about. So, historically, this is very different, and a lot of fields medals have gone to uh, projects in low-dimensional topology, because essentially this is where we live in, right? Low-dimensional is saying 2D, 3D, 4D, something like that. Of course, 2D is something we draw on our paper, 3D is where we live, 4D is like space-time if you want. So these are kind of the crucial dimensions, um, and low-dimensional topology turns out to be very different from other topology. And that was a huge problem. Just think of the Poincaré conjecture, formulated, here's our little Poincaré conjecture, formulated in, in Poincaré's work that we just this, that just pull up like 1900-ish. I think it was 1903. Correct me if that's not correct. Um, it was, by the way, never a conjecture. It was always just a question. But anyway, and then famously solved by Perelman uh, quite a bit later. Yeah, so really difficult conjecture. And traditionally, low-dimensional topology, very different from algebraic topology, the, the rest of topology. So exotic structures in four space. Ah, it's really, really nasty. And the problem is, um, most technology that was available until the 1980s was like based on classical algebraic topology. And they're not very, they're not really good. They're just not, not doing a good job. Yeah? Essentially, you can think of if algebraic topology would be useful in um, low dimensional topology, Poincaré would have done already everything, you know? Poincaré was very smart. Poincaré would have done already everything. And quantum topology essentially started then in the 1980s and offered a new approach to low-dimensional topology. A uh, very much categorical one. As far as I can tell, nowadays there are two approaches. The one Perelman used is more like the bridge flow type approach. It's more like differential geometry, if you want. Uh, complex analysis. And there is this quantum topology approach, which is more like category theory. 
very strange, very different approaches. Roughly started, both of them roughly started in the 1980s. Say it again. Low dimensional topology, difficult field, very different from other types of fields, but very important because like space time and everything is low dimensional. Yeah? I don't care about a 500 or 12 dimensional space. Maybe someone does, but I don't. Um, but it's kind of very different. You needed new tools, and there are two approaches. One of them is quantum topology. Cool. And this is also where the name topology comes from, because it, I think, because it was kind of useful in low-dimensional topology. And the quantum, yeah, so low-dimensional topology, was the key player to coin our name topology in the name quantum topology. And the quantum really comes from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That's at least how I read it. So there are somehow two ways to, um, so oh, let's do that. Heisenberg, uh, they're probably very nice. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And I, I really don't give a fuck about the general statement. I, I want to, I want a meme, meme. I want a meme, yeah, beautiful. So let's see. Um, yeah, why, why not that one? Can we make this a bit bigger? Oh, yeah, so what is it? Knowing the exact position of an object and knowing the exact momentum of an object? Hmm, which one is it? Which one is it? I can't tell. Do we, this was the one I stole from XKCD, by the way. So shout out to XKCD. I will can have a look at that one and there are like a billion more memes. And what is this one? Uh, Heisenberg Department of Physics. You're probably here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, this is like the other point of view. So let me just so keep that in mind. You're probably here. Uh, versus the one I have here, you can't have location and momentum at the same time. And they're like two different perspectives of what quantum mechanics is. The you are probably here is referring to that in quantum mechanics everything is like a probability distribution. And when people say something is quantum, they either mean that, like in quantum computing, it's more like about a distribution, yeah? or they mean this other point of view on it, which is something that doesn't commute, right? Essentially, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says measuring position and measuring momentum versus measuring momentum and measuring position does not commute. Uh, so this is like this non-commutativity. So it's another way of thinking about quantum is non-commutativity. And in quantum topology, the quantum is referring to non-commutativity, right? Say it again. Two ways to think about that. Probably even more ways to think about quantum. But anyway, two key ways to think about what quantum is. One of them is like everything is like a probability distribution. You're probably here. And the other one is this idea of non-commutativity. Right? In our in our setting, whether I put my left arm before my right arm or whether I put my right arm before my left arm, these are not the same things. Right? So in, in this sense, we want them to be different. So it's a little here. And yeah. So quantum topology studies non-commutative uh, systems, structures, whatever. And this is where the quantum comes from. Right? So let me try again. Topology comes from, well, it was applied to low dimensional topology. And quantum comes from we study non-commutative structures. Well, so hopefully it makes some sense. And the, kind of the key event that started quantum topology was uh, Jones here. Jones very happy. Jones very happy gets the Fields Medal in 1990 for the discovery of the Jones polynomial. And this is still one of my favorite examples of a Fields Medal. Because usually if you just look at the list of Fields Medals, very impressive, very impressive works. But I read this and I always have the feeling like I, I could have never done that. I mean, that's very impressive, but, but no, no I, I could have never done that. For the Jones polynomial, now we'll cover the Jones polynomial eventually. It's like, it, it's, it's so simple. It's so unbelievably simple that you really have the feeling, I could have done that. It's of course a lie. I c couldn't have done that. But at least you have the feeling, right? Very different from other fields medals, which are usually very deep mathematics and Jones polynomial. Some are not deep. It's amazing. So people have missed that thing for a hundred years and it's just, it's just amazing. And here's a quote. Um, so it, it really relates many, many different fields. Originally, like, Functional analysis for Neumann algebras, yeah, very, very strange. It's actually absolutely brilliant. Sits in the kind of the nexus of so many fields. And yeah, so this was like the beginning of quantum topology because the Jones revolution is 
it actually happened around the same time as the discovery of the Jones polynomial, that they are not just, it's just not just this one new invariant, which is this Jones polynomial, or in low dimensional topology, but there's a whole zoo of them. There are infinitely many, and they are different from everything people have studied before in some sense. And yeah, so now you, you really, we really went from having nothing to having infinitely many. That's really an important revolution and definitely deserves a Fields Medal. Beautiful. There's another Fields Medal associated to this in 1990. Uh, Edward Witten, the physicist, also got a Fields Medal for related type of ideas. So it really relates a lot of, a lot of fields. Yeah. So, and the way I'm going to attack this, oh, there will be a lot of diagrammatics. Yeah. So really, for me, draw diagrams and I will just explain everything drawing diagrams. For me, category theory, so people always think category theory is abstract nonsense, and it's not really true. You just draw a few diagrams and everyone is happy. And by the way, you can actually computer verify the diagrams. So they are kind of, these things are called string diagrams, string diagrams, but because they are strings, I guess. And you can literally build a computer that can do the manipulations. But anyway, everything will have some interpretation, not everything, but most of it will have some interpretation in these low dimensional pictures, uh, just using category theory as a cataclysm to understand kind of low dimensional topology, but just drawing it nicely in space. And yeah, so that's what I'm going to do. And it will be a lot of fun. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you will enjoy this lecture series. And I hope to see you next time.